for you created my innermost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my formless substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me. Well, good morning, New Hope Leeward. Hey, can we make some noise for those watching online right now? Let them know you're here. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us here at Kapolei. Thank you, those of you, for joining us for Leeward Online here in Hawaii, all around the world. So glad that you are here. Today, we're starting a brand new series called Shape. And in this series, we're talking about the unique way that God has shaped you for the furthering of his kingdom and glory here on earth. I want to start out with this statistic. It's been said uh, that one out of every three people is a genius. Like one out of every three people is a brilliant world changer. And there's a simple way to find out who they are, okay? So we're gonna do that here together. If you're watching online and you're watching by yourself, then I guess it's you, okay? You can just claim it. But for those of us here, and if you're watching with others, we're gonna find out who's a genius. One out of every three people is a brilliant world changer, okay? So would you look at the person on your left? Okay, and if you turn to the wrong left, you can disqualify yourself now. It's not you, okay? No, 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 I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Okay, look, okay, look at the person on your left. Just look at them for a minute, study them, okay? It's clearly not them, okay? So look at the person on your right. They're worse, okay? So it must be you, amen? amen okay. Everyone's like, yeah, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> the reality is, it is you. That's the reality of all this. It is you, and it is the person on both sides of you as well. It is you, that you have been chosen by God to change the world. Would you say amen? amen? Okay, if you don't believe that yet, hopefully you will by the end of this morning. I want to jump into the text today, and I want, to, I want to bounce around a little bit more than I normally like to do. But what I want to do is I want to lay a very nice foundation for this series so you know exactly what we're talking about over these next several weeks. And I want to start off in Ephesians 2. So if you want to pull out the app, you can follow along on there. If you want to pull out your Bible, uh, Ephesians 2, and we'll start off in verses 8 through 9. And these might be, verses 8 through 10, might be some of my most favorite verses uh, in the Bible, at least top five for me. But let's just start off verses 8 through 9, and it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We have been saved by God's grace, the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And there is not one of us here that can say that we earned it or we deserve it in some way. It's this beautiful gift that we can never pay back. And what do you do with a beautiful gift that is so lavish? You receive it. And the reality is, I want to just brag on God for a moment. We had a great handful of people receive uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior last week. We had 46 people and 29 of them for, or for the first time. Yeah, you can give a hand to that for the first time. And the amazing thing about this, this season, I know we see the pandemic and it's just this big negative, but the amazing thing about it is some of those people were here in church with us and some of those people never even stepped foot into our church, but they were watching online. And I want to read you a testimony. So this, this came, in, uh, came into our Instagram. I think it came into our email as well at the church. And this was somebody watching from Wahiwa. And so, so this is what she said. She said, thank you for today's sermon. I've been watching online here and there, but I admit I definitely hadn't committed myself to God. Today, all of that changed. So amazing. I was in tears. I've always felt like I wasn't worthy of God's love. I've dealt with so much in my life, 
my parents and their substance abuse, the weight of having to care for my siblings, judgment for being poor, anger, being told I was a mistake, being cast out and attacked by my in-laws, all of this always making me feel like I'm not good enough. I felt like God forgot about me or didn't care enough to save or help me. But today I found my way home. I felt like the pastor was preaching right to me. I am worthy of God's love. I am enough. I have accepted the Lord today, made him my God, and I felt his presence. This is online. Felt his presence. There was even rain this morning, maybe signifying a blessing, cleansing, but I found my way home, and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Is that beautiful? Yeah. So beautiful. Thank you. If you're watching, thank you for letting me share that. I, I actually, asked her if, if, actually asked her if I could. And it goes so well with that text. We are saved by grace. The undeserved, unmerited favor of God. It's a beautiful gift that we receive. And once we do, so if you did last weekend, you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the first time or yet again, or for all of us, really great reminder. Once you do, you receive that grace. It is not the end of your relationship and journey with God, but rather it is just the very beginning. Let's look at verse 10. It goes on. It doesn't end there. It says, for we are God's handiwork. Okay, let's just stop right there for a moment. We've got to look at this word. Handiwork, you'll sometimes see it written as workmanship, work of art. My favorite is the NLT says, you are God's masterpiece. In the Greek, it's the word poema. It's where we actually get the word poem from. You are God's poem, something meticulously and thoughtfully put together. And you saw that in that intro video uh, they were reading off. That was Psalm 139. Here's what I'm saying. You can write this down in your notes. You are an original. I want you to start off by feeling very, very important here. You are an original. There is not another like you. You are one of about, it's kind of hard to tell because we have a lot of our people online now. You're one of about 2,000 people in this church. You are one of about, if you live here on Oahu, um, because we have those online that are kind of around the world, but if you're here on Oahu, obviously those of you here are, you are one of about a million people here on Oahu. And in this world, you are one of about 7.9 billion people on earth. Now let me tell you how big, how big a billion is, because our brain goes million, oh yeah, billion's a little bit bigger. It's way bigger. I'll tell you how much bigger. All right, 100,000 minutes ago was about 70 days ago about two months and some change. So we're talking like July. A million minutes ago, that was about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago, so maybe like October 2020. A billion minutes ago, oh, you're thinking, oh, Josiah, what are we talking about? Like 2001? Are we talking like 1990, which my kids still lovingly refer to as the 1900s? Are we talking about 19? They do. They really do. I hate it. Are we talking about 1990, the 80s, maybe the 70s? Okay. A, a billion minutes ago was 119 AD, right around the time Pastor Art was born. Okay. It was around, <laughs> it was around, it's around that time. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I, know, I know many of you are like, I'm going to look this up on Google. Google it, man. Go for it. I checked my math like 40 times on this because I, I always have a hard time. I've shared this before. I always have a hard time believing how much bigger a billion is than a million. That, over 1,900 years ago, billion minutes ago, okay? So you are one of 7.9 billion people on earth, and yet God knows you personally, intimately, deeply, more than anybody else. Even down to that very hairs on your head. Even the insignificant things, he knows about those too. One of 7.9 billion people and billions more that have ever existed in the history of life, and yet not one of them has ever been exactly like you. I once heard a pastor say that if we were to read off your DNA description, like just one, one letter a second, it would take about 96 years to describe who God made you uniquely to be. Okay, let's go back to the text now with that understanding. For we are God's handiwork, his masterpiece. Not to just look good, not to just feel good. There's a purpose. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, good things, fruitful things, things for the kingdom, which God prepared in advance 
for us to do. It was a plan that has already been set in place. There is a purpose for your life. If there wasn't, then the moment that you received Christ into your heart, God would have killed you in that moment and taken you to heaven. Because why leave you here any longer? It's so much better up there than it is down here. He would have taken you in that moment. There's a reason why you are still here. A reason why you woke up this morning. There is a reason why you still breathe. And I think a lot of mornings, that's not my first thought. I don't wake up in the morning and be like, oh my gosh, I'm a complete original and God has this plan for my life. We wake up and we wake up with a groan, amen? Because it's another day and it's another week. And the reality is, I don't say this to make anybody feel bad, but just to have you understand, some people went to bed last night and they did not wake up this morning like you did. So there's a reason for it. There's a reason why you and I are here. And not just for a new eternity with him one day, but a new life with him now. Turn with me to Luke 5. And you would have read this in your devotions this week. I read this and I was like, yes, this is what we are talking about. Uh, Luke 5, I want to just kind of paraphrase the first part of the story and then we'll kind of read the part we want to focus on. This is, when, uh, this is when Jesus calls some of his very first disciples. And what's happening right now, Jesus is teaching at the Sea of Galilee. It's towards the beginning of his ministry. A ton of people are coming to hear from him. And so Jesus gets on Simon Peter's boat and he teaches from the water to kind of prevent everybody kind of from crowding around, makes it a little bit easier to teach. Now, when he finishes, he tells Peter, who is tired, exhausted, and frustrated from trying to fish and catch nothing all night, he tells Peter, hey, pull out to deep water, let down your nets for a catch. Peter, after explaining his situation, what he's tried, he says, okay, because you say so, we'll go. They have this catch that is so big, they have to call their partners, James and John, and the other boat, who would later become disciples too, to come help. Peter's blown away, and that's where I want to jump in. He's moved by this miracle. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, so the big catch of fish, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So he falls to his knees. And this is amazing. He's not a disciple yet. And he acknowledges who Jesus is, calling him Lord right here. He says, get away from me. I am too sinful. Which I think is a natural response when you and I think about the fact that God has a purpose for our lives. We immediately think about all the reasons that God could not or would not use us. It is natural to feel unworthy in the presence of a perfect God. And normally what I'll do when I preach about this, I'll tell you, too bad, God chose you, get over it, and we move on from there. And you know what, I say that because you can't stay there. You can spend your entire life making excuses for why God can't use you. But I realize it's actually not a bad place to start. It's not a bad place to start. Admitting one's inability and sin is often a prerequisite for service in the kingdom. So when Peter cries out, Lord, I am a sinful man, that goes to the top of his resume. It's the cry of someone who is not sure in themselves and someone who is wholly dependent on God. It's not a bad place to start. Look at what Jesus says. This is why we can't stay here. Verse 10. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So notice Jesus doesn't say, you're right. And Peter, I can see that you have a temper and that's going to be a problem later. So I'm going to need you to deal with that. Would you fix yourself, read these books, take this class, and then maybe you can come back and I will consider about you being a disciple. No, no, no. He, he says, don't be afraid. Don't worry about it. Stop concerning yourself with it. Follow me because you'll fish for people. You'll have a new purpose. Why? Because you're finally ready. It starts now. The moment you're ready. We're going to do this. Now, I need to say this. It's very important. Sometimes, like in this case, God will call people to quit their job. Quit their job, go off and be a missionary. Like Pastor Todd, quit their job and work for the church. Sometimes he will do that, but not all the time. And I need to say that because, true story, 
I talked about the Sabbath two weeks ago. Supposed to work six days, special day of rest, one day a week. Uh, uh, Sister DMs me on Instagram and literally says, I told my boss that my pastor said I need to Sabbath for an entire week so I can't be there all week. I was like, sis, one day. And she was like, oh, haha, selective hearing. Okay, so, so do not call your boss tomorrow and be like, oh, my pastor said I'm gonna be a fisher of men now. And so by the way, I quit my job. Oh, and your breath stinks. Cheat, like don't, don't do that. Keep my name out of your mouth, okay? Don't be, don't be saying I said things, all right? So not every time does God call you out of your job. I, I would say this, most times, Christ calls us to carry out his will right where we have been placed. To do what he did, to live like he did, to love like he loved, right where we are. Right in the job you are, the neighborhood you are, the friends that you have, so that we may bring people to him. Every single one of us. Now, it might look different. It's not just preaching out of your Bible to them, showing Christ being his light. We do that in a lot of different ways. But for now, let's just come to this conclusion. This call is not just given to Peter or pastors, but to every single one of us. And you are here. The reality is you are here right now. You're watching online right now because someone told someone who 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 told told you about Christ. If it was only dependent on pastors the gospel would not have continued on in that way. That all throughout the generations, throughout history, people have taken this call seriously. It's why we are here. Verse 11, let's look at the last part I want to look at in this story. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Okay, I'm super cheap, so whenever I read this story, I always think about the catch. Okay, now maybe they sold it, but if you really take the text for what it is, it looks like they literally, it says they they left their nets, they leave everything there, and they just follow him. And I don't know what the price of fish was back then, but I know what it is now. And if you go to Foodland and you want spicy ahi non-frozen, you want the fresh kind, it's like 20 bucks for a thing that big. I spent my entire stimulus on spicy ahi. I'm not joking. It's a lot of money. So I don't know what it was back then, but this is the biggest catch they have ever had in their entire lives or maybe ever seen in their entire lives, and they just walk away. Why? Because Jesus has more. Would you say amen? Okay, that's good, because this next part is going to be really convicting, okay? So just know that it convicted me. Stay with me for a moment. I'm going to make a point. There's a blessing that comes from knowing Christ. It's clear. There's a blessing that comes from being saved. And it happens right in a moment. There is joy. There is hope. There is love. There is grace, transformation, belonging. It happens in a moment. When we come to Christ, it is kind of like that big, giant catch of fish. This blessing right in the beginning. And a blessing for us every single day. And Jesus from there says, I have purpose. I have more than this. This is really great, I know, but I have more than this. You will fish for people. You will fish for people. You you will do what I did to your, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers. You will be salt on this earth. Not salty, salt. You will bring out my flavors in the world. You will be light. You will shine light in the darkest spaces. You will love your enemies. You will pray for them. You will make a difference in this world. And we say, that's okay, I don't really want to do that. Can you just come back and can you bless me with a catch next week? Can you make me successful in my job? Take what I'm already doing, Jesus, and can you just make it a little bit better? So make me successful in my job. Protect my family. Lord, would you bless my food, even if it's not good for me? Would you just bless it anyway? Provide for my needs. Can you take my life and just make it a little bit better? So Jesus, that all sounds really good, but can you just come back with a catch next week? Actually, you know what? You don't need to come back. I know where to find you. I'll be back in a week. And so here's my question to you, and this stung me. Have we settled for a Jesus who changes our day, 
rather than a Jesus who changes our life? Have we settled for a Jesus who changes our day? The American dream Jesus, if you will, who makes our lives a little bit better, a little more blessed, a little more comfort. Have we settled for a Jesus who changes our day and not a Jesus who changes our life? Have we settled for the catch? Have we settled for the blessing and the comfort? And if you have, it's okay, but I want to tell you that he has so much more than this. You were created for more than to just exist. You were created for more than to just live the rat race of life and you pay bills and then eventually you die. You were made for more than that. You were saved for more than to just sit in church and receive. I'm not saying this to convict you, but you were saved for more. You were saved for more than to just watch online every single week because Jesus didn't die to change your day. He died to change your life. Amen? And the reality is sometimes, sometimes, and I've been here, church gets very, very boring the worship team's not doing it for us. Pastor's not doing it for us. And sometimes, yeah, it can be, but I, I find a lot of times if we've grown bored in our faith, it's because we have systematized it and we have scheduled it. It's a time and a space that we meet with God and we do the same things week in and week out. A life with God has never meant to be boring. He died to change your life, the very reason for why you exist. So if you've settled for the fish, Remember that he tells Peter here, I'll make you fishers of men. If you've settled for church, then Jesus says, you know what? You are going to be the church. You're going to bring people in. If you've settled for the blessing, then Jesus says, you know what? You are going to go out and be a blessing. If you have settled for comfort, Jesus says, you will now go out and comfort others. Why? Because Jesus has more. He always has more. And so here's what I'm saying today. You can write this down. You are an original, we talked about that, created for an original purpose. And so don't walk out of here feeling guilty or burdened. Would you walk out of here feeling purposed today that there is a plan, there is a calling that is only for you? And I think our, our idea a lot of times is if I don't do it, then God will just send somebody else. If, if that person doesn't, you know, somebody else will feed that guy. Somebody else will pray for that person. Somebody else will serve there. But the reality is if we're going to accept that you are a complete original, then that means there is a complete original purpose that is only for you. And if you don't do it, he's not going to just pick somebody else and move you out of the way and put it there. And he's not going to give up on you either. So the moment that you are ready to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to begin to walk in that, it's not this moment that you just, you do it and now you're perfect. But if you're going to begin to walk in that, he is ready in that moment. So you and I, though, we all have the same calling. How we carry that out is going to look very, very different. <clears throat> And that's why God made you, you. That is why you are the way that you are. That you, you have the personality that you do. You have certain likes and dislikes. You work and you live in certain places. There is a reason for all of this. You are like no one else because you have a calling that is for no one else. This, this series, a shape that we're doing, it, it's not a new idea. It's actually based on, uh, there's this, a uh, church in California called Saddleback, very giant church, Pastor Rick Warren, he came up with this uh, term shape and uh, one of his staff members, Eric Rees, wrote this book. And so this series is gonna be based on this book. Let me read you just an excerpt from it. It's so good. It says this, God doesn't create anything without value. Okay, your, your name is included in that. God doesn't create anything without value. He is the ultimate craftsman. And he designed you specifically to fulfill a unique role in his ultimate plan to establish his kingdom on earth. Once you discover who you are, then you can start figuring out what God has planned for you, the specific way he designed you to make a difference in the world for him. Whenever God gives us an assignment, he always equips us with what we need to accomplish it. This custom combination of capabilities is called your shape. And shape is actually an acronym. And each week, we're going to tackle one of these letters. Now, here's what shape means. I'll go through each one. S is for spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about this next weekend. 
Spiritual gifts is a set of special abilities that God has given you to share his love and serve others. We all have them. Heart, the special passions God has given you so that you can glorify him on earth. Abilities, the set of talents that God gave you when you were born, which he also wants you to use to make an impact for him. Personality, the special way that God wired you to navigate life and fulfill your unique kingdom purpose experiences. Those parts of your past, both positive and painful, which, let, which God intends to use in great ways. <clears throat> this series, I, I want to say this, as we talk through each one, I want you to know that this series is for everyone. So for a moment, I'm going to talk to you. If you are a young adult, you are in high school, you are in junior high, you are a kid, and you come to church or you are forced to church from your parents. When you hear things about purpose, a lot of times your mind goes to, oh yes, this is for them, or maybe it's for me one day, but I tell you it is for you right now. Church, would you say amen? I don't think we nurture this enough. That right in the school, the friends that you have, there is a purpose that you have there. King Josiah, who I'm named after from the Old Testament, I have the most biblical name on planet Earth, Josiah David, okay? So Josiah... I really do. My parents thought this out. They tricked me into becoming a pastor. So Josiah, King Josiah was, uh, started ruling God's people at age eight. And he would go on to bring God's people back to them, uh, back to him. There are some of you here that you feel like you're too old. You're retired. Your time has passed. Let the kids work the church. Let them do the work. And I, I want to tell you, you are not past your prime Moses, we just talked about him through our last series. Moses, we always kind of imagine him before Pharaoh crossing the Red Sea as a spry, like 40, like 50-year-old. Moses was 80 years old when he was doing all these things. You are not too old. There are some of you here that you're, you're scared to leave behind, scared to leave behind your net and follow Christ, and the reality is every single person has been scared too. There are some of you that think that you are too broken, your past is too broken. Well, Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, killed and locked up Christians before coming to Christ. You don't get much more far gone than that. There are some of you that don't think you've been a Christian long enough to do anything. And the reality is we have Peter here, day one, calls Jesus Lord. And Jesus says, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're not too anything, too young, too old, too new, too broken. You're not too anything because God can do anything. Would you say amen? amen. And if you've been a Christian a long time, I'll talk to my old timers real quick. You've been around the block. You've heard series like this before. You've done the spiritual gifts test. So you already know what it's like. Can I tell you this? Our entire staff went through this book. Okay, before we did it, we, we, like, we like to guinea pig our staff before we do it to the church. And so we all went through it. And I want to tell you this. It is amazing how much God still has to teach you about you. Even if you've been a Christian 40, 50, 60 years, God still has so much to teach you about you. And to feel like he doesn't, it's actually, a, it's actually an arrogant statement because God still has so much to teach you. So wherever you are, the reality is this series is for every one of us. I want to leave you uh, with one last thought. So in this series, our hope is that you would discover your identity, who God made you to be, that you would discover your purpose, what he put you on earth to do. But there's something I want to tell you that's interesting about you, uh, identity and purpose, and it's this. You can write this down. Identity and purpose are discovered in community. They're actually discovered with other people. Let me explain you might not be convinced of that. That's okay. I'm going to convince you. Identity and purpose, they're actually discovered in your relation to other people. I remember a couple of things about um, my, my wife's uh, first pregnancy and delivery of our first child. And I remember it being crazy. I remember it being scary. Uh, ladies, you always do this thing because you can't see what's going on. So you tell us husbands, how does it look down there? And we look and we go, it's good. It's not good. Okay. It's never good. It's never good. And so it's like, it's crazy. You don't like, nobody knows what's going on. I remember this moment so clearly 
the moment my, my son, I have four boys now and one girl, my first son emerges out of the womb and he looks like my grandfather. He's so angry and they hand him to me and I'm holding him and I remember in that moment not feeling ready to be a dad, like at all, not even a little bit. But I remember being blown away in that moment because even though I didn't feel ready, I was indeed a dad. I was a father in that moment. My identity changed, my purpose changed. Why? Because I now had a son. Actually had very little to do with me. I, I now had a son. Your identity and your purpose are, are tied to other people. If you think about it, you are a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a grandparent, a spouse, a friend, a coworker, a brother, a sister in Christ. Why? Very little to do with you. It is all about your relationship to other people. So identity and, and purpose are meant to be discovered and, and driven by community. And this is why God brings us together into this very beautiful mess that we call the church. We're going to talk more about this next week when we talk about spiritual gifts. We're meant to discover our shared calling. We all have the same calling and our unique purpose together. And so I've been saying this for the last couple of weeks, and it's okay, I'm going to say it again. If you really want to get all that there is to get out of this series, we want every single person to jump into an Ohana group. Why? Because you find your identity and purpose with other people. It's the way God made you to be. And so if you just come to church, that's good. If you just watch online, that's good. It's a good start. It's like going to the gym and getting like 20 minutes out on the treadmill and then piecing out and going home. It's not bad, but you're not really going to get everything that you need. And so every single week, we're going to teach up here, and then what's going to happen is on our website, there's a tab that says Ohana Groups. On the website, there's going to be a video for each week. So our staff and our pastors have taken each of these letters, each of these topics, and they've drilled a little bit deeper. So you'll get teaching on the weekend, only so much I can do in 30 minutes. And then you're going to get our staff and pastors teaching as well. And then you with a group of people are going to talk about it and go a little bit deeper. Now, if you want to jump into a group, we'll put it up on the screen. You can email us, groups at newhopeleeward.org, or you can text us, Ohana Group, to 77411. And most of our groups are online. If you're not comfortable being in person, if you are, we have a couple in person, but most of them are online. They're actually on Zoom. So it's easier than ever before. If you're... If, if you're actually watching online, you're from the mainland, another part of the world, you can actually jump into a group. You can jump into a group now. And if there's no groups in your time zone, West Coast, East Coast, then maybe it's time to start a group, church. Would you say amen? amen. Okay, you had my back. Good. The other services didn't have my back in the moment. Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's time to start a group. And so we've had people do that too. Like, I know there are some of you, like the pandemic hasn't made us more social. It's made us less social. So it's good to jump into a group. Some of you are not there yet. And we've had people be like, you know what? I don't want to jump into a group, but I got three people and I can actually start a group with them. That's great. Would you do that? If you know some people you attend with here in church, even people from other churches, if you want to do it with your spouse or as a family, we encourage you. We would rather you do it than not do it at all. So if you want to even start a group, would you do that exact same thing? Just let us know. We want to know who's doing this study uh, with us as well. If you want to get all there is to get out of this series, please, would you jump into a group? Would you start a group? I want to say this too. You don't have to be a biblical scholar in order to run a group. We'll give you the videos. We'll give you the packets. Literally, all you got to do is discuss with other people. And so would you please jump in with us? You have a week to do so. So our Hana groups are not starting this week. We've given you a little bit of a head start so that we can all find a group this week. And then next week, after we do spiritual gifts, our groups will start and they will go for six weeks. So for all five weeks, and then they'll have one finale week just for the Ohana group. So again, if you're here in person, it's even easier today. As you leave, there's some tables out there and you can actually grab cards based on the day of what group is meeting. And so you can even grab a couple cards and then decide later which leader do you want to email. And if you want to start a group with just some family or some friends, you can actually grab all the packets today as you leave at the tables. If it gets a little backed up, social distancing and all that, if you could just, it'll take us about five minutes to get through the line. We would love to serve you before you go today 
And the point of all of this, I'll give you the why one last time before we pray. It is not for more volunteers. It's not a cattle call for us to get more volunteers, although we always need volunteers. The reason we are doing this series is we want you to know why you wake up in the morning. When you wake up tomorrow and it's Monday again, it's always Monday. I don't know why that is. When you groan, you're first groan. I want you to know that there is even purpose in that. When you breathe, when your heart beats, there is a reason that you are alive. And I think a lot of us, again, myself included, I'm not just preaching at you. I think we've lost that over this last year and a half. I know we felt very aimless. And so my hope is that this series will bring some step back into your heart. It'll bring some color back into the world because there is a reason why you exist here on earth. And sometimes it sits across your dinner table. Sometimes you tuck it into bed. You're going to see it, you're going to see it tomorrow at work. We pass by all these purposes every single week. You are so dearly loved and treasured by God. And let's end on that note. Would you bow your heads with me? And would you do this for me, church family? Would you just breathe in? One nice breath in. Breathe in. And breathe out. One more. Breathe in. And breathe out. God, there's reason for that breath. There's purpose for that breath. We're not random. We're not just a, a random bunch of cells just happen to be brought together, put on one of the planets that happens to have the best gravity and the best temperature and air, and we can actually live and survive here. The one planet out of all the planets that has spicy ahi, praise God, you know, like that. The one planet that we're like, it's not random. Like we're not just cells put on this planet. We exist in this big mass space. And one day we're just buried in the ground and it's over. No, 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 no. We're made for so much more than that. And so God, if we don't know what to do with all this, if it sounds so big, leaving our nets behind, being fishers of men, would we not get so worked up on everything that we have to do? Your burden is light. It is easy. So what is the next thing we need to do? Do we need to apologize to somebody today? Do we need to love a little bit better in our house? Do we need to just say hi to people when we get to work tomorrow? Do we feel a little bit aimless, Lord? Do we need to jump into an Ohana group? Whether it's people we know or just linking up with random people online, not totally random, but people here in this church and just discovering why we exist. What is that next step for us? Will we just take that wholeheartedly? Because we know, we know, we know that Jesus, you always have more praise you for having more for us. We love you, God. We don't walk out of here with guilt. We don't walk out of here with shame today, but we walk out of here very, very purposed in you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. And we pray this in your matchless and your holy name. And we all say together, church, amen. amen. Can we give the Lord another hand?